Crank up the volume and get ready for real-world bird hunting by listening to the Wingman Podcast by Eastman's. Now your host, Todd Helms. <laughs> this episode's brought to you by Federal Premium. Guys, I've been shooting Federal shot shells for a really long time. You know, whenever I had to scratch up money from whatever chores I had to do and jobs I had to do when I was a kid, I always grabbed a box of Federal Premium. It worked for me back then, and it still works for me today. Everything from the TSS heavyweight black cloud loads to the traditional black cloud loads to the blue box speed shock and now the new heavy bismuth loads, Federal's got a load out there for your price point, your budget, and your level of performance that you're looking for. So, be like me, reach for Federal. That is my unashamed opinion. Hey guys, welcome to this week's episode of the Wingmen Podcast, and I've got Pat Shalady on with me, or Shalady. 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 Yep, that's. I'm sorry. I've, we've heard it <laughs> several ways. So yeah. You got close enough. It's one of those deals where I, it, it's a it's a name that's very unique, and you're never gonna forget it. But Shalady, Pat Shalady. Pat is out here. He's a Wyoming guy. Lives just down the road, so we thought it'd be cool to sit down and record things in person. He is a die-hard Upland guy, and here in Wyoming, that means he has a steady diet of Huns and Chuckers. He's also uh, Cheatgrass Setters, got a YouTube channel out there. You guys got to check that out. Make sure, we'll drop down, and in the description, we'll give you uh, a link and a title so you can find that stuff real easy, but we're just going to chat about Upland birds right. and, and dogs and guns and all kinds of fun stuff. First of all, Pat, thank you for coming on. I really well, appreciate thanks it. Thanks for reaching out to me. Yeah. So uh, I've before I think we've met here, this, which is the first time right yeah, now. Yeah, first time you in know, person. I have on occasion have have uh, listened to your podcast well, thank on you. YouTube. You know, but, you know, I'm kind of a upland guy. I used to duck hunt years ago, sure. but and you have a lot of duck hunting stuff. But, we do. But we I are. usually when you have some upland stuff, I'm usually listening. So. Well, I appreciate that. <laughs> yeah, I've been on a string of upland stuff good, these last good. few episodes. So I thought, yeah, before we get yep. completely into turkey season. Yeah, you bet. Well. So we'll keep the we'll keep the upland train rolling. Yep, we haven't bet. been hasn't been that far since out since chucker season closed. Well, I think it what the February twenty eighth. Yeah, so like that. that's it gave just us more time this year. Yeah, it did. So that's kind of a surprise. You know, it, it always ended January what thirty first. Yes. And all of a sudden, a friend of mine called last summer. Hey, you know the season it goes till the twenty eighth of February. I go, you must have read that manual wrong. Right. <laughs> no, he was he wasn't kidding. So it's nice to have that extra time. It was. It was. Uh, I'm. I was mixed about it. Um, you know, our season runs uh, was running from September fifteenth yep. to January thirty first, and that's that's a lot of hunting, and um, no complaints there. But um, there's a point in time where the birds probably need a little bit of a break, sure. and I was really concerned about the February season. The birds starting to get into their breeding mode, you know, sure. pairing up. So, you know, after this, you know, now we're into March, you know, and I can you know, safely say after the February season, uh, extension to the season, that um, I'm for it. Um, the Huns were starting to pair up right at the start of February 1st. Okay. Self-restraint. Self sure. You're out there pointing um, uh, pairs of Huns, let them be. You don't have to shoot a bird. Right. The Chucker pretty much have um, stayed kind of in their coveys, their coveys up until now. In fact, a friend of mine texted me this morning over from Cody. He, um, uh, Took kind of a walk, and he just lost his really good uh, flushing oh. lab. Just to, she had some issues, and sure, she sure. Uh, until the, I mean she was hunting up till the day she died almost. So he's got a new pup ordered, so he's going to be back on that saddle again soon. So, um, but he went out this morning just kind of checking out some country, and he told me he jumped five cubbies of uh, chucker, and each cubby was twelve or plus birds. That's so, still a big family. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I, I again, I think uh, I think the extra month was great. Yeah. You know, and again, we can we don't have to pull the trigger. Yeah. No. You know? Yeah, you're absolutely right. And we right. I talked about that on my last podcast too. Just because your dog goes in and goes on point, doesn't mean you have to walk in and pull the trigger. You can walk in and flush those birds and watch them sail off into the sunset. You can do that. You know, and uh, I know the biologist, and I don't think they're 100 percent incorrect on this, but the biologist will tell you, you know, hunting really doesn't have any factor on the game right. populations. Right. But you know, I do know this. I've never seen a dead bird lay an, lay an egg. No, you're, you are correct there. You are so, correct. There. Yeah. So we this past, so February hit, and um, what, what I did too, I tried to uh, also with the chucker is 
you know, instead of going for a two or three birds out of a covey, you know, hitting one or two to three at a time, sure. just take one bird, you know, sure. take one bird. And again, with the pairs, if birds are pairing up, chucker or, or the huns, let them be. Right. You know, right. my dog's been around the, the world a few times. Not shooting every bird to them is not going to hurt them. Right. You know, they'll right. give you the stink eye. Yeah, I'm sure there was well, one, one of your videos I watched recently. You had birds right on the edge of this. Big, oh, I did. This yeah. big cliff. Yeah. And uh, and I'm not gonna I'm not gonna blow <laughs> spots, hot spots. <laughs> but a lot of your stuff, because I'm a local guy, I can tell. You know, local guys are gonna oh, know yeah, where you, you are. Bet. Oh, definitely. There's Some no of that. secret. Yeah. But but you did something really interesting that that I have personally done as well. Those birds were right on the edge and flushed out over the edge, and there's really no good way you're going to recover those birds if you shoot them. Well, it's been a while since I've been to that spot. So as I got to those dogs, we had a what happened was we had a covey that were um, running on us. Right. And they got right to the edge, and I realized, again, it's been a few years since I've been to that exact spot, but I realized, you know, that cliff is about a 200 foot up and down. Right. Uh, it could have hit the bird. You may not have recovered it. A dog could have went over. It's that's probably going to die. That's my that's my big thing. We're right. Big. I don't need to get a dog killed. Exactly. Uh, myself, I don't want to get on that edge. It just that's one of those places that's like, wait a minute. I know this spot. Right. And it's just you know, uh, we're trying to have fun out there. Now we're we're serious about what we do. Oh yeah. But we're not that serious where we're willing to. Yeah. Yeah. That's, get something killed over it. That's. I just. I was impressed by that. I was impressed that you had enough control over your dogs that you could bring them back. Mm -hmm. They were and they didn't want to quit. Oh no. You know they're like, come on, they're right there. You right. Know? But right. It's one of those deals where, it, in hunting across the board, whether we're talking big game hunting, waterfowl hunting, upland bird hunting. You have to be able to assess a situation as it's unfolding sure. and make those game time calls. I've I've walked away from bull elk in mm -hmm. similar situations where they're right on an edge. Sure. And I got snow on the ground and I'm by myself and I'm like, if I shoot that bull, he's going to go off that ledge or right. slide into that bottom. And I don't know if I'm going to be able to get him out of there. Right. So knowing those situations, knowing an area or being able to recognize the situation on the fly, for us a lot of times it's looking at a retrieving scenario here on the local river we shoot or going someplace else and being able to look at a situation and being like, I can't put a dog in this. Sure. And I suppose with duck hunting, ice shelves. Ice shelves are bad. You bet. Yep. Yep. Especially this year wasn't too bad. Um, we had that cold snap, froze everything up really solid. So it, it really limited where you could hunt. Sure. But knowing your spots, knowing your areas now, we... The last day of season, we did go the before that. The day before, we did go down with chainsaws and tamping bars and break away a lot of ice. Oh, you bet! So we could have a safe place <laughs> right. to get our dogs in and out. But yeah, it's knowing those things because you, your safety and your dog's safety comes first. Yeah, and um, you know I do have some people I hunt with on occasion too. So you got to be cognizant of the other guy and cognizant of uh, shooting the bird over the dog. Yes. Uh, I've had a lot of times where, you know, the do the birds just, they, they get up and they sort of then playing out yep. just they're about, low. they're low, you know. Um, so you got to be careful that way. Um, I almost shot a dog one time. And I'll tell you what happened. Um, had two dogs on point, and this is back five, six years ago. And so I'm going in, and it's, a, it's Chucker, pretty good sized covey. So I'm going in, I have the dogs trying to, okay, where are the birds at? I'm going to try to kick them up and then, of course, get a shot. Sure. So as I'm going in there, you know, the birds, they, they were more, I think, to my left than I thought. Uh -huh. So as I'm going in, they really hooked it to the left hard, and I swung on them, and I'd kind of forgotten where one of my dogs was at. And he was on a little bit of a, I wouldn't call it a hill, but a little bit of a knoll. And so those birds were here, and that knoll's about here, and here's that dog. I mean, he's in the line of fire. I mean, I swung and all of a sudden I'm pulling the trigger and all of a sudden there's my dog. And I, luckily I, I still pulled the trigger, but I went up like this. Sure. I don't know how close that really was, but it's, it, it's as you gotta be cool, Spooks cool, you. <laughs> it, cool it a little bit out there. Yeah, yeah. You know, so I'm always, I, that was a lesson learned, you know, it's uh, imperative to, especially with these pointing dogs right. and with anybody's dog, a, a plushing dog, right. know where the dog's at. Right. You know, uh, and these birds sometimes get up and don't, they're not low. Chuckers are, man, I've seen that so much with chuckers, especially where if they're not, kind of my rule of thumb is if on a, in upland hunting, if I don't have some sky underneath that bird, I'm probably not going to pull the trigger. Sure. I had a scenario last year up in Montana 
where that in this hunts on YouTube, where we walked, had a covey of Hans flush off of a ridge top mm -hmm. and come down and around around a toe of this ridge. Sure, we didn't see him go down. We're like they're they're going to be right there, and we worked around the toe of the ridge, and the dog went ahead of us. And as when we came around the corner, the dog was pointed, but she was uphill of us. Yep. And those birds were uphill of the dog. Mm -hmm. Right. And I came around, and it's one of those deals where you come kind of over the rise, and everything's right there. Birds flush, and I, I mount the gun, and it's like dog, birds, and I just, yeah, like that. Right. And down the hill they went, and I never did have a shot. The dog was in the way the whole time. And I, I asked the guy later on, I said, man, how many, where was your heart? Was it in your throat in that situation? Because mine was. Sure. I was like, <gasps> Yeah. And he's, he said, yeah, he goes, I really appreciate you being experienced enough and, and having the wherewithal enough to just, nope, there's no shot there. Yeah. He's like, man, I've had a lot of close calls. Sure. So a gentleman I've been hunting with out of Cody, uh, his name is Steve. He's very cognizant when he's hunting with me on yeah. Arm with the Dogs. I, he's even, you know, uh, refused a shot that I knew he was okay. Right. right. But Better safe than sorry. Better safe than sorry. Yeah. yeah. You know, uh, we all love our dogs and that's. You know, we don't want to be the guy that shot their own dog. Oh, man. Or even worse, shot your buddy's dog. You hear horror stories, you know, and, and that's something that was drilled into us growing up hunting. We, of course, we hunted a lot of rough grouse at Woodcock in the North Woods. Um, and you always wanted to know where that dog was. And normally with, with, with those two types of birds, they skyrocket. I mean, you, sure. you, they flush up. Yeah, especially with so, grouse. You bet. And, and woodcock and in the woods, woodcock, they want to get right up yeah. there. Yeah, and if there's any worry about your where your dog is, you just don't shoot. But, man, we, we put so much time, so much effort into these dogs mm -hmm. in training, and in, and they're part of they're part of who we are. You right. know, my two knuckleheads are home curled up with two sick kiddos right now. Sure, One sure. in each chair. I went home at lunch, <laughs> and there's a lab in each chair with a kid. Right. You know, and it's like. That's that's part of what they are, who they are. It's it's interesting, though, I, and I noticed that from your videos. You're always very cautious, very cognizant of where your dogs are, and I appreciate it. And I love the fact that you're out there laying down chucker hunting content. There's not a mm -hmm. lot of that. Well, I've <laughs> I finally um, graduated up up to a uh, GoPro recently. Yeah. So I used to use, and I people still use on occasion, a crappy cheap little Canon one shot. Sure. But you can't. Okay, you can't, you can't this, shoot. You can't shoot yeah. the camera and the gun at the same time. Right. You know, you can't do two things at once like that. So, uh, a lot of times, you know, I'm a neat little film going into the point, but I, hey, I got to shut it down and get the gun loaded. You know, upland is the hardest thing to film. You know, we've it's done, tough. We've done a, a little bit of it here and there. We did a hunt in Montana, and it was it was okay. But we, it's if you got pointing dogs, it's a little easier. Um, but we did a pheasant film that's wildly popular on on Facebook of all places. Mm -hmm. Somehow it got served in like I think Pakistan, and I've got like <laughs> it's ridiculous how many millions of views that thing. Sure, has. sure. But that was one where we took some kids out, put some birds out, and we did yeah, sure. You know, a, a kid hunt, and we told the story of mm -hmm. of pheasants. You know, being introduced to the to the North America, and it was fun, but. Even then, we got done with that, and the couple of camera folks that I had run, Lindsay was one of them, she goes, wow, this is way more challenging sure. than hunting than filming waterfowl or filming especially big game. Right. She's like, this is so hard. Well, show like, I think, the flush. Yeah. I think they filmed for so several much days. much respect for those guys. You know, they, they filmed for several days just to try to yes. get, what? Uh, half a know, dozen. A half, half an hour. A half an, a half an hour. Yeah. Yeah. And... Uh, you know, and uh, so it's tough. Now with me and the GoPro, so a few issues I've had, just um, sometimes, you know, it's not pointed where you want it. Yep. It's some, you know, I had one great video, I thought it was gonna be great, where dogs did a great job going in and the birds flush really close up to me and the camera was pointed down the whole time. So it's yeah. a nice video of my boots. Of your feet. Some people <laughs> might like that, but. <laughs> so how did, you, how did you decide that you wanted to start filming these hunts? Ah, that's a that's a good question. Um, I'm a guy that really, I don't know. I've I grew up in a family. This this is not right or wrong, but there was never a whole lot of pictures taken of us kids, sure. and I don't think of any motion pictures. So I've been, you know, hunting. I'm fi just turned 59 here. Well, in October, so okay. 59 and holding. <laughs> so uh, so. Um, 
You know, I've had some, you know, as a kid grew up in Iowa, and uh, back in the 70s and early 80s, lots when, when you never heard of South Dakota for pheasants. Lots of birds, right. You bet, and I grew up on a nice farm, had a lot of farms, and it was before really that 19, I don't know when things all went to heck in, in Iowa for habitat. I think the farm bill of 1985 is yeah. when they started plowing all the fences, yep. all straight in the waterways. No fence rows. Used yep. to be a lot of farms were still not very big and had 40 acre pieces with a lot of a lot of mulberry and brush and weeds, you know, pheasant mecca. Yep. So I could go just out my back door, you know, and, and I got into coon hounds. Okay. So, you know, never got a lot of pictures of some of those really good dogs I had over the years. So now, um, you know, first I was taking just with a simple uh, digital camera, taking a lot of just still photos and, and then start filming a little bit, you know. And I've got, I'm not, uh, listen, I've got, I don't know, 300 subscribers or less. Sure. You know, I'm, um, the Kardashians aren't worried about me yet. <laughs> <laughs> or whoever you know these people are these influencers. You're doing it because it's fun. <laughs> but I've got just create, a, I got a, a small select group of friends yeah. that really like to to see some of that stuff, you know. And um, what's sad is though is so I'm capturing some of these 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 dogs on on motion pictures now, right. which is nice. I'll be able to go back later. Absolutely. So now back to the GoPro, you know. At times I've had some great footage that would all of a sudden, all of a sudden look at it later showed, hey, there's a mountain I don't want somebody to see. There's yeah. a cliffside. Just some of this stuff you we can't. Do, we you have can't. To be so careful. You do. You can't stuff. give some of this yep. stuff away. You know, yep. um, we've got some great hunting here. Uh, I don't know what the internet says about Wyoming. It's usually not very good. Oh, there's no birds in Wyoming, so people want to believe that. That's okay. But you know, in the basin, um, we do have some birds. We do. We do. We have some. You know, I, I think I've been in the basin for all about ten years now total out of the 15 or 16 I've lived in Wyoming and that I I really enjoy the bird hunting we have. Yeah, know? and I think it's one thing. I have had some friends travel quite a ways with me to hunt here. Sure. You know, and cuz they know what we can get into a lot of birds right. and everybody has a young dog that they they need bird work, you know. So this is really bird hunting here upland hunting and 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 uh uh, the basin here is really an insider's game in a way. You've sure. got to kind of live here. So I'm not religious about GPS and every single f point I have. Right. You know, I don't set, but I, I do GPS my spots. And, you know, I've been doing this for quite a while now, and I've got a portfolio of spots that are probably, once I kind of slow down here and, and catch up on that stuff, um, I've probably got a thousand waypoints. That's phenomenal. Now what happens in Wyoming here with with the Huns and Chucker is is again we we had a great season this year. We had a lot we, of birds. Yeah we did but every year I've, I've been able to eke out a pretty good season. I'm you know we're, we're running some pretty good dogs and they they do have the opportunity to get onto birds. Yeah. But which I I'm here I'm here I've been here enough uh, long enough and and have been out hunting enough here that the main problem with hunt, Huns and Chucker in Wyoming is inconsistency. One spot can be hot and the next year 100% dead. I have noticed the same thing. Now, I, and what I do, I do a lot of preseason scouting. So about mid-August, mid, uh, uh, sometimes with, but a lot of times without a dog, I scout a lot of my old spots and, and scout new spots. I'm sure. looking for, I don't care if it's a bird, that, you know, a chucker's across the road. Checking tracks out by a sure. creek or a pond. Sure. Once in a while, running a dog on a creek or a mountainside to look for birds, talking to a oil guy or a pipeline guy. You see any birds? You know, um, to try to get a feel for that coming season. You know, so um, but we're, it can be inconsistent. So, but with, when you have a lot of spots, you, you know, you can control your own destiny. Right. If, right. if spot A went bad, you got spot B to check out and spot C. A good example. Now, this has probably been. 11, 12 years ago, there was a, a spot that was mostly huns, some chucker. Um, there were so many huns, if I try to describe it, it just sounds like just like a, a tail. Right, but, right. But literally, you could just go down a two track with a fish net out and you're flushing birds with your truck. And uh, so, a good example of how many birds, we, I had a really good dog at the time, a setter named Tug, that um, we hunted him two and a half hours in this spot one time. Uh, we had a, a big group of guys and almost too many guys. We just hunted him alone. And this before any of us were, had really GPS stuff mm -hmm. on us. 
Uh, and one guy had an old pedometer. So I can tell you this, the dog pointed 19 coveys of hunts wow. in about two and a half hours. And we kind of made a big circle of the truck. And one of the guys said, my pedometer said we went 2.8 miles. So a pointing dog, at least kind of a big running dog like my right. setters, they say they go about three to four times whatever yeah. your person's mileage is. So but that, now that next year, Todd, I mean, this, that, we almost spent the whole season down there in that whole area because there was just so many, so many birds. birds. Oh, it was nuts. Right. Yeah. Next season, so, you know, I'm, we're licking our, <laughs> yeah, you're licking our lips, wait, yeah, waiting right. for, so um, had a couple of us met up, uh, four of us actually, so one guy with some pretty good uh, English pointers, he's going this way, he knows the area, I'm going with a couple pretty good English setters with another guy from Kentucky or, or Tennessee this way. And we hunted all day and got back together, and we saw a total of, that was my group, uh, we had one point on four hunts. Wow. I mean that, between, you know, from the year ago, it could have been with the dog power and the, the hunter's knowledge that, in that group. That could have been 40 points. Did you have a rough winter in between those years? I thought it was fine. And I've, I've so I'm always a little nervous, you know, watching our winter oh, yeah. and our spring. I've kind of given up on that because I've, I've had years where, oh man, this is a horrid winter and it's a nasty spring. It's just been snowing and raining and there's no birds that are going to be able to hatch. Last year. Yeah, Last exactly. Year was brutal. And I was worried. It was brutal all over the state. It and was. Even, and, and we get easy winters here yeah. by comparison yeah, to, we the do. Re, to the rest we do. of Wyoming. We right. get pretty easy winters. But even here, we had a lot of deep cold. We had right. pretty deep snow. We had um, wet spring cold wet spring and early summer that lasted a long time and i was actually when i started messing around um in september looking for birds and looking at looking looking around and doing some bumping around for antelope and different things mm -hmm. i was really surprised at the number of chuckers in particular that i was seeing yeah so i you know this yeah it looked like to me a, a bad winter and a bad spring yeah. and so i'm scouting there and mid-August and I'm not liking what I see. You know, I'm a little concerned. Sure. Uh, f saw a few birds, but not, I, I figured, I'm seeing, I thought 80% less than what it should be seeing. Wow. Maybe 90% less. Well, we're gonna, you know, we're, we're still gonna hunt, you know, so. Yeah. Season yeah. rolls around and, you know, we had, a, we had to end up with a really great season. There was a lot of birds. Now, I think what some of the birds did, especially the chucker, is, uh, I wouldn't call it a problem, but it was sort of an issue early in the season. I think they had a late hatch. Okay. And so we were getting into coveys of just chicks. Little ones. That look like metal larks, they're so small, you wow. know. <laughs> <laughs> you know, so we're not, yeah, you know. Yeah, and, yeah, um, yeah. and then, um, I remember some of the huns were small, but I, um, but anyway, it was a great season. Um, you worry about that, and I, the birds find a way. Yeah. But areas do die. And for whatever reason, you could have what I thought would be a great preceding winter, spring, hatch season in the summer, and where are the birds? So I that very I had a spot to the south of us here that was for four, five, six years in a row, it was like the go to, it was like a honey hole. Mm -hmm. In fact, in and I'm not as diehard an upland guy as you are, but whenever it got cold, I don't want to put my dog in the water to hunt birds, we'd go We'd go walk about. You bet. And great way to get some exercise, get to keep the dog in exercise. Yeah. And it's just fun. It's a good mm -hmm. time. And I had a spot that was money. Money in the bank every time you went. And about three years ago now, I went in there and nothing. There was no bird tracks. Hmm. There was no, there was nothing. Right. And it has not recovered. It's never come back. Yeah. Some of these spots are just, um, you know, it's a flash in the pan. Yeah. And um, some of these spots, they, I, you know, I, I, I got to imagine it's kind of like uh, rough grouse run. What a seven-year cycle was roughly, that? Roughly, it was. It's roughly okay. seven years. So we were just talking. I think before the camera was rolling, you know, I, you, you've got a brother up at Highlandville, yep. Iowa, yep. up by Decorah. Yep. You know, I lived up in that area for several years. I had a farm up there for pushing twenty years. Sure. And um, I've been back a long time. I, I sold it quite a while ago, but uh, we had rough grouse, mm -hmm. and I remember those guys had that cycle up and down that low hardly any and that that high there were so many it was nuts yep you know now i understand northeast iowa has almost no grouse yeah i think i'm not sure my dad and my brother have ever seen a grouse on the place 
Sure. And they've got quite a bit of woods that my brother manages for bedding area for whitetails. Mm-hmm. Um, they have done a lot of habitat improvement in the form of CRP, planting windrows, doing all kinds of stuff, mainly for, for deer. Are they on Bear Creek? Deer. Bear Creek They're through the North Bear Road. Okay, North Bear, yeah. Yep. 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 And <clears throat> what they've seen is they've seen their pheasant numbers and their turkey numbers go come, sure. come up big used to be time. Never, used to never be a pheasant up there. Right. Now yeah. he's got lots. Wow. And he's got huns. Huns, really? He's got huns. Okay. Yep. And that was something that when lived there for four years and never had never seen a hunt and didn't see a lot of pheasants. Sure. Did a lot of nest predator eradication. You bet. And got, and once, and you can take those, you can knock down your coyotes, but then your nest predators don't have anything knocking them down, so they yeah. they balloon. It's a vicious you cycle. Do both. Yeah. You do both. And, and so Highlandville used to have a lot of grouse. <laughs> I would believe it. That you know, whole, all the places I've been there, you know, when I go back to visit and go trout fishing or yeah. go turkey hunting or whatever, the woods. I'm looking around. I'm like, this looks like good grouse habitat. The mm-hmm. other thing I think, Pat, is a lot of that habitat has gotten really mature. Right. People right. don't people don't log like they used to log. You know now. They're looking at selective logging, where they're taking out specific trees from timber stands. Right. Well, that doesn't open up your canopy mm-hmm. enough to get that young growth that those grouse really like. Mm-hmm. And if you look further to the north, Wisconsin, Minnesota, the Upper Peninsula, Michigan, where I grew up, sure, that's a constant rotation of timber cutting for pulp right. production, paper production, namely. Um, and so you're in a constant flux of different ages of timber. And those grouse thrive in that. Right. So, so do woodcock. Yeah. And so it's really interesting. And I, I have to laugh when I, f- I had a very good friend, still have a very good friend from Northern California, and he grew up hunting quail and hunting chuckers up there and different things. And he, the first time I took him into the woods to hunt rough grouse and woodcock, he's like, how, how am I supposed to shoot these things? Right. <laughs> They're so thick. I'm like, sure. when the grouse, when the bird flushes... Yeah, you just shoot, and yeah. if you can't see it anymore, you're probably still going to get it. And then you listen for the thump. Yeah, right. Now we do got them. We do have a few roughs here in Wyoming. We do, you know, and of course we have the blues. I actually I got a rough grouse. It was totally incidental this fall. Was hunting cow elk, and was coming down off the mountain on this trail, and this rough grouse. Flew, flushed across huh. the road in front of the truck. Yeah, and I was like, that was a rough grouse. Yeah, you bet. <laughs> and I could tell by the way, it, by the way it was going, that it, right. it didn't go far. Right. And so I got my young lab out of the back, got the, got the over and under out of the back seat, put a couple shells in, walked up, and he got birdie, flushed it, <laughs> shot it, and he retrieved it. <laughs> sure. That's the only nice. I guess I, that might have been like the second rough grouse yeah. I shot in Wyoming. Yeah, we do have some. Yeah, I've never, to my knowledge, have pointed a rough grouse. I've seen them a couple times up in Sunlight Basin, across yep. the road. Actually, yep. actually, I saw one one time um, outside of Cook City, right there in the park, right yep. by uh, I think Pebble Creek. Sure. That's a rough grouse. Sure. But and I used to hunt the blue grouse here, but I don't much anymore because we have some issues with uh, the west side of this basin. Yeah. You know, has those uh, big hairy. Yeah, a couple different kinds. They have the kind that the canine variety that'll eat your dog if That's, you're not careful. They worry me more than the bear. They do. T- me um, too. Me and too. I don't worry about grizzly bears too much if I'm out running a dog. And usually, if I'm hunting, I I, I try to make my blue grouse hunting those first couple weeks of September. Sure. Those birds are tend to be more out in the open at right. that time. Um, they're eating grasshoppers and berries and more. They're much more open. They're much more willing to flush, and they're sporty when they actually flush. Yeah. Other than if you're hunting them in the woods, they have a tendency to just fly up in a tree. And Limb chickens, you. yeah. Yeah. So, you know, with, um, <coughs> I don't think, at least it's been a few years, um, of the Absorcas here, um, there was never a time I was up there that I didn't have a bear following me. Wow. And I, so I started, um, you know, I thought, well, geez, I want to hunt. And, uh, of course, I'd have the bear spray because... You know, just in case you have to mm-hmm. have a, a, an encounter with a bear and have to use lethal okay, force. Montana two years ago shot one yeah. while he was pheasant hunting. You know, you've got the feds to answer to, and they'll they'll ring, ring it through the ringer. It's gotten better, um, you know, being a big game. Our parent company being big, obviously big game, is really tuned into that. And it's really gotten better as far as um, defensive defense, being able to defend yourself. Yeah. 
they look at it and take all factors into consideration, but it's still not something you want to have to deal with. Yeah, so I'm a Benelli uh, semi-auto sure. loader guy. Sure. 20 gauge for, you know, about everything for Bepland. So what I did was I actually um, um, bought a uh, 20 gauge uh, double barrel. And now normally what I do is um, I don't have a gun. Well, I'll have like Chucker and Hunt hunting. I don't put a shell in the chamber till I'm ready. So with the gun point, is with pointing dogs. Why would you? Yeah, and exactly. You're looking to walk up behind and flush birds off of a point, and you're walking through some pretty treacherous terrain at times. Right, and that way too. And you know, you could break open a mm. over and under. And right. You're, so, but what I did up there was I started loading that over and under with slugs. Sure. And of course, I got my bear spray, and I got a 44 mag uh, revolver. But that's a lot of weight after a while. Oh so, yeah, where are you out? Yeah. So that's just and what I <laughs> what I do is you know if I never had an Never had to use it, but uh, but you got to remember if you dogs go on point, you're going to flush those blue grouse up there to take your slugs out. Yeah, I didn't always forget about. It. Uh, I'm sure. <laughs> How'd so, I miss that bird? But you know the bears. So the bears worried me, but I was worried about the wolves for the for the dogs. Yes, so 100%. out in this big wide open, and even some of the rugged chucker hills, my dogs they're they're out of uh, you know English setters out of um, horseback trial stock. Okay. These dogs have uh, you know some wheels under them. Right. Normally in some of the big open country, um, you know. 400, 500, 800 yards is nothing right. for these dogs. Right. I mean, I've got one. He's. I'll probably never have one like him again. I'm. We're gonna hopefully keep him alive. He's four years old, but, um, man, he's got a set of wheels on him, you know. But he's a bird finding fool. All my dogs. I'm. 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 I'm very fortunate. I'm not a trainer, sure. and they've all kind of just developed into what they're gonna be. But, um, the, my dogs will in that blue grouse country. They'll. They'll dial it back. They'll dial it back to about 150, 200 yards. But you know, if you had a pack of wolves over a hill, yeah. you know your game's yeah. up. So, okay, Plan B. Let's go to the Bighorns. Um, love the Bighorns. Uh, can be quite a few blues up there, but that early season is just so many of these. And I'm not picking on non-residents. I'm I'm one of the few residents that realize that non-residents pay a lot of bills yes, for our fishing. Do. You know, game and fish. Yep. You bet. But. You know, and those guys, hey, they draw a tag, and they're, they're coming from Michigan, Iowa, Illinois. They get on Interstate 90, Minneapolis, and let's, you know, bighorns. And um, beautiful country, you know. And there are, there are some elk up there, but, and they're all anticipating a great hunt. But the problem is, you know, they're, they're not, they don't have inside information. A lot of times they're in spots where there's really not any elk in that early season. But there are blue, blue grouse, yeah. so they're kind of encroaching on me, and I'm encroaching on encroach, them. Yeah, you're just, I've, I've done the same thing. Yeah. Where, I've bumped into guys and they're mad because you you know you're you know bird hunting it's our elk season and yeah I get it I, I get it right so I, I live here I've I've got the option I I, I know a lot more about the area than most of those guys do right. you know so I've got other places to go so but it's um, you know back to that this was not blue grouse season but this is kind of interesting so that last video you were uh, referring to where I had the dogs on the edge of a cliff yeah. So um, that's a pretty good area. I was in there early in the season, and so that's a mountainside. And I'm on the other side of it. It's sort of divided by a big, I'm just going to call it one of those big old dry washes. Uh -huh. So the other side's kind of bad landy. There are some chucker in there at times, but the good hunting is up on that mountainside. Right, right. So I get there one day, and here's... Um, Here's a truck with Michigan plates. I'm picking on Michigan guys. Go blue. Everybody I guess. does. Go yeah, blue. Go, go blue, baby. <laughs> but uh, I'm an Iowa Hawkeye, so I, that's. So I, trust me, we root for, we root for both teams in our Yeah. Lives. So, um, so I got to kind of my parking spot, and here's three vehicles from Michigan. And one of them was a tra an RV or an uh, ATV trailer, sure. you know, with the ramps down. So I'm figuring, oh, these guys, there's a road that goes way up high. That's where these guys are at. So. My plan was to kind of hit the Badlands side a little bit. Then, where that gully's not so deep, I'm going to cross that and get on that mountainside and work our way back. And so as I'm working, you know, hunting that um, that Badlands sign, the dogs I think pointed a covey fairly quick. And so okay, we I don't remember if we got a bird out of that or not, but um, kept on going. And I could see the guy with the ATV was up on a hill up on that mountain, just you know uh, scoping and. The other guys with them, they were sort of spread out on that mountain, uh, just with all their gear on. You know, they're spread out about a, I don't know, probably 300 yards apiece. There was, sure. and you know, so I thought, well, those guys are there. There's no elk this time of the year, there, to my knowledge, but they don't know that. 
and they're having a good time, I'm sure. And I can come back. So I kind of made another loop through the Badlands and had a few more points. But um, but the hell <laughs> drove me nuts was where those guys were at. The hills were just ringing with chucker. You could hear them. And I wonder if those guys even know what they were. Yeah, probably not. <laughs> At the probably time, not. you know, the hills were just ringing. So I'm like, okay, we got to get back to here. So, you know, flash forward, I think, oh gosh, probably a couple weeks uh, later, I went back and it was it was fantastic. Sure. It was just an it was an awesome hunt. That's the beautiful thing about living in an area where people want a vacation. It can be frustrating right. at times because we're all we're dealing with folks. Public land's public land. Yeah, I, it I, is. It is. We are fortunate to have the amount that we have here, and it's you know share and share alike type deal. I do a lot of my upland hunting, like I said, later in the season. Mm -hmm. We I have a pretty full schedule for big game in September and October that kind of makes me focus on that time frame for those things. Um, so a lot of my upland hunting is later in the season, and there's very few people out. Yeah, very sure, few people sure, out. Sure, I can run my dogs. I feel I feel like because I'm running Labradors, um, and I and my dogs are very fit. Never have a problem covering country. Mm -hmm. Obviously, they're not. I can't have a lab 800 yards no, away. No, He's that doesn't be work very well. Yards right, away, you know? right, right. <laughs> and. Um, but I can run them in that in those cold temps, and they don't get overheated. We can hunt all day. You know, sure, it's, it's, sure. it's way easier for me to do that. Now I'm in the process of looking for some sort of a bird dog. I don't know if I want a setter or a pointer or sure. a Brittany. I don't know right. what I want. Yeah. But yeah. I would like to get a bird dog, an upland bird specific yeah. dog. And not that I'm biased or anything, <coughs> you know. <laughs> but um, you know, I really enjoy the the type of dog I have. Um, I really enjoy, and I'm. You know, physically fit enough to keep up with them most of the time, sure. you know, but, but, you know, I'll tell you, um, you know, there's some guys that do well with, with flushing dogs, like yeah. a lab. So a friend of mine who just lost his dog recently here, um, he had a really, uh, a really good flushing dog. He was, he's harvested uh, really a large number of birds, sure. but he's, uh, he's stacked the deck a little bit. So you know, he got in this upland hunt, and he was duck hunting at first a little bit with the dog, sure, sure. and just really started to get into the uplands, you know. And uh, but he's to even the odds for his dog. He's he's made a point of learning about the bird, you know, the yes. chucker and hunts, yes. the habitat. Yes. See, I've got the luxury. Certain habitats you can't put a, a pointing a flushing dog into. Well, certain. It's not going to excel. Well, it, I used to live in Florida years ago, and they always said, you know, for fishing in the ocean, you know, a lot of water out there. It, but only 10% of the ocean holds holds fish. Sure. Yep. I can. I think it. You could say that about upland I hunting. I 100% agree with you. So you got to recognize that habitat. Now with me, I do have the luxury of cutting these fire-breathing dragons loose and covering a lot of ground. Right. I'm still looking for that habitat. Yeah. But I can kind of blindly say, hey, I've been wanting to hunt this valley for years. Mm -hmm. Let's go you for know. a stroll through that. Yeah. Let the dogs sweep it. Well, what Steve was doing with his his really nice lab was, you know, he's. You know she can't she can't run 800 yards out and she can't cover a whole big hundred thousand mm -hmm. acre basin mm -hmm. so he's got to if he's gonna picking. he's got a cherry pick better Absolutely. and he's uh, so he hunts with me a lot so he doesn't bring he wasn't bringing her with us because he was afraid she would try to keep you know run with the setters right so he hunts with me with with the pointing dogs and he'd go off uh, when on his own hunts on another another day with with his uh, flushing lab but he uh, has, has done well well with her so um, and it was really a she was a dog that had some kidney issues that just reoccurring and, oh, and uh, just it was it, had, it was time to, yeah it was rough so but he'll he'll get back into it so he's yeah I've got this dream and I've had it forever and it, and it and it comes back from when I was I think I was in college and I was hunting one of my rough grouse and woodcock covers and would walked out and I'm walking back down the road and I've got my lab with me because I always had labs. Had a few bird dogs over the years, a few, few pointing breeds over the years, but always had a lab in the stable. And I come around this corner, and here's this older fella, beautiful Parker shotgun. Mm -hmm. I mean, looked the part, right? Sure. And he's got a lab at heel. Paper holes and, you oh, know. <laughs> had a lab at heel yep. on his left side, and on his right side, he had two Britneys. On a lead, on, a, on leads, mm -hmm. and he's just walking. That lab was just like, doo, 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 doo. well, we're coming together, so we start visiting, <clears throat> and uh, 
I asked him, you know, if you've got these two Britneys, what, what's the lab for? And he said, the lab never leaves my side. Hmm. And he said, this is my flusher and okay. my retriever. He's like, my Britneys will, re- will retrieve. Right. But he's like, not like this lab does. Sure, sure. And I, that was, ever since that day, man, that's been my dream. Have a lab at heel and a couple of bird dogs out just canvassing. So another friend of mine who was uh, <coughs> hunting with me uh, quite a few years ago, he um, uh, had a lab that actually, he we would take her along. Sure. So um, she would pretty, pretty much stay close pretty to tight. him. Sure. And uh, so we'd go into, uh, you know, go into a point with the with the setters, and um, she would. Uh, I said, you know, can I release her? I said, sure. If she wants to flush them, that's fine. Well, she's they've got the birds. We're either we could flush them or she could. So mm-hmm. she'd go in there and, and sometimes have the flush, and then uh, if she could beat the setters to the bird, have a have the retrieve. Sure. But a lot of times setters are setters, and mine are actually retrieving pretty well. But um, once in a while, they'll they'll find that down bird. So, uh, but once in a while, they won't bring it yep. all the way to you. Well, so right here, I did my job. Well, no, the, <laughs> so and one of the reasons for that is the, the emphasis on the the strain of dogs I have are again horseback trial dogs, yeah. and those trials they they don't kill the bird and have right. a, and, and retrieving is not part of the game. Right. So that's not a really a, a, a high criteria sure. for these guys. So. So, uh, but I, I tell anybody, get out there with your dog. Um, again, yeah, I like, I like what I have, you know. Um, um, I'm pretty biased towards these running, big running pointing dogs. Um, get out there. It makes, don't be afraid to make mistakes. Right. You know? Right. Um, you don't uh, feel like you have to have all this gear. You know, this guy, this old guy I was talking about, he was dialed, but who knows how long it taken him to afford that Parker shotgun. Oh right, or you bet. You know we run we run Savage Renegades sure. almost across the board. Yep. And I've shot some pheasants with them. And that's a that's a fairly mildly priced gun, right? It's not an expensive you know, shotgun. You know you can get into that gun pretty easily, and it's a great gun, kind of a do all. Don't feel like you've got to have a certain gun to go do this or a certain dog. Like you said, go right. Go hunt. Dial up Onyx. Find some public ground that looks birdie and go hunt. This episode of the Wingman Podcast is brought to you by Leupold Optics. You know, I've been running Leupold Optics for a long time on the big game side of things, and I love the performance and the quality of that brand. But when Leupold brought sunglasses, I'm sorry, performance eyewear into the mix a couple of years ago, I thought I'd seen it all, but I was wrong. That performance eyewear from Leupold keeps my eyes protected. It helps me with my target acquisition with a crisp, clear sight picture. And guys, I got to be honest with you. I'm stoked to be partnered with a company like Leupold. So for all your optics needs, give Leupold a look. And I'm going to turn that part of it over to you. When you're looking at ground, what do you look for? We got kind of talking habitat a minute ago. Mm -hmm. We got off of it a little bit. But... What are you looking for when you come out into a new area, per se? Well, what I, Todd, what I started to do years ago is, um, you know, when we get into birds, I started to make a note of, okay, we got we just found a covey of birds here. Mm-hmm. What's this train look like? Right. Um, you know, I think there's a misconception out there. A lot of people think, uh, we'll talk about chucker, especially. Sure. They just keep it easy, just the chucker. Yeah, yeah. Sometimes they're thinking, you've got to have these huge, high, straight up and down right. cliffs, and right. and it's nothing but rock. And yeah, chucker do kind of like those formations out there. Um, what I look for a lot, and I can't, I don't know if I can quantify it, um, but it seems like there's a ratio out there of, of um, Let's do, let's do let's let's back up a little bit. We'll keep keep it on chucker, but there's some areas where um, I'm getting into chucker, which, which is plan, uh, pancake flat. Mm-hmm. So we'll we'll speak about that first here. And yeah, there might be some cliffs. You might be on a mesa or a plateau, sure. so you do have some big tall cliffs. But sometimes those birds are right where it's flat. Mm-hmm. Chuckers sometimes like flat ground. They they do. Um, so in that type of terrain, I started noticing there was a ratio of of um, of uh, sagebrush to grass out like there. A mosaic. A mosaic. Um, I don't know what that true ratio would be, but you just all of a sudden I start, wow, this is. So there's one area. Are you talking big sage 
Little C. Well, not more, you know, that three foot stuff. knee high to three, yeah. three foot waist yeah. high. Uh, so this one area, we'll, we'll, we'll stick to this one area. It's a flat cake, uh, uh, pancake flat um, uh, mesa. I'm going to say it's, jeez, uh, uh, I don't know, 5,000 acres. Sure. Maybe, maybe not that big. Sure. Um, it's probably, okay, it's about a three, okay, it's about a half mile wide and about a mile to a mile and a quarter long. Yep. So, um, uh, but that's probably a 320 acres. So maybe it's not you know 5,000 acres, but you know that's we're big country. Yeah, so it's, it's and we, big, and we like to exaggerate sometimes. Why not? <laughs> Why not? We're bird hunters. So, <laughs> so anyway, um, so that area, um, we were getting a lot of points on shucker out on that flat stuff, and and so some of that would be heavily covered with sage. Some of them had just small clumps and a lot of grass. Some of them were had. I'm going to guess the perfect ratio was about 40 percent sage and then about 60 percent open grass, okay. you know, um, but that was, I kind of come to that conclusion about four or five years ago, so I've been using that since then. And so sometimes I can look at an area, maybe it's an area brand new to me, and I thought, well, it has that ratio of, uh, of sage and, and grass, mm -hmm. so let's, and let's give it a, let's give it a whirl. Right. So, you know, we have a cheatgrass problem in sure. Wyoming. The whole West has a cheap grass. Problem. Yes, it does. And, you know, I've always said, you know, Chucker and Huns are from the, you know, what used to be, I'm not sure what they call these countries. Asia up. Minor. Asia Minor. There you go. Eurasia. You know, <laughs> yeah, from no, you're right. As Afghanistan yes. to Turkey to yes. even Greece. Spain, Greece. Yes, where yep. you have, you know, Chucker and, and Huns. And um, so that's where cheap grass came from, too. So... If you eliminate 99% of the cheatgrass we have here, there's still more than enough cheatgrass to feed every chucker and hunt in this basin. Because that's the thing that I was talking to, because it's the exact opposite for native native grouse, like sage grouse, for example. Right, right. We need to eliminate that cheatgrass because they that builds fire load, kills sagebrush habitats. Sure, I mean, we sure. know that. Um, but... I have found over and over again that I find huns and chuckers in cheatgrass swaths. Mm -hmm. They're eating those yeah. seed heads. Yeah, yeah. So, so yeah. And I hate to say this because we really don't want cheatgrass here, right? And we're not going to eliminate it all. <coughs> so, but you sometimes in those areas, then we're talking about these mosaics. Now, then let's get away from maybe that perfectly flat stuff. And yeah, you've got some kind of that rougher country with some exposed rock right, right. that the chucker really like, and the huns too. Um, but a lot of times, the secret to that is too, is there's these little swaths of cheatgrass here and there. Um, it's always nice to know there's some water near. It could be just a, a seep. Right. You know, a chucker hunt, he needs just a thimble of water. Right. You know. Um, so there's always, you know, if you can get some water close, and they'll say a chucker will go three miles one way just to get water. I and I, I kind of believe that. I would believe that. Because I've hunted some areas where there's no water. There were some reservoirs that are bone dry, but yep. they're, they've got to be getting water somewhere. But I guess, too, they can lick dew in the morning. And somebody suggested, and this might be correct, apparently sagebrush, <coughs> as the roots are right underneath the, the ground there, have bulbs on them. Mm -hmm. And I think, you know, and I've transplanted on my little ranch and some sagebrush, and they will have these little bulbs. Yep. And they said those are actually filled with water. So a lot of times the birds will scratch and dig and mm -hmm. peck at those. So... So habitat out there, yeah, you're looking for um, a lot of things. But um, what I find is, you know, um, our chucker um, don't always follow that um, uh, volcanic rim rock script like Nevada and Hell's Canyon and all that. It's interesting to hear you say that because I've, I've experienced the exact same thing. And I've, I've beaten myself and my dogs up climbing through rim rock. And, yeah, there's birds. Mm-hmm. But it seems like most of the time I'm chasing the top of the hill and then they fly back to the bottom and I don't get a sure, shot anyway. Sure. And so I've learned to try to focus on some of the stuff that you're talking about. When it's really nasty weather, it seems like some of that heavier, taller sage really congregates some birds for just thermal cover for sure, them. Sure. They want to be in it. Um, and man, for a flushing dog, that's ideal because right, they right. hold in, in that stuff. And you're talking, it's like shooting quail, you know, yeah. at, at that point. Right. But holy smokes! And, but overall, I think I've seen more birds in that mosaic habitat where it's a, you have cheatgrass mixed in, 
you know, some native grasses, you've got some sage, right? but it's more grass than sage. Mm -hmm. and man, I find, and, it, and, and if I can get a little roll to that landscape or some draws, the heads of those draws, it seems like that's where I find a lot of birds. I'm not a fan uh, as uh, regarding chucker and hunt hunting in the, the six to eight foot tall, thick, thick sage. Right. See, I, th I believe the number one predator are these hawks. Sure. And I would agree you know, with that. You know, hawk and perch himself up on, on top of a, you know, tall, uh, what they call the Wyoming sagebrush, the big tall the stuff. The big sage, yep. I got Wyoming a few areas sage. though, it's strange, is where uh, there's spacing between some of these uh, big sagebrush on a creek bottom where there's a lot of birds. That's where I've uh, seen it too in creek bottoms, more than anything. Yeah, and in some areas, sometimes there's no birds at all. So they either like it or not. Right. My opinion and my experience, um, Chucker and Huns do not like trees. A um, couple things, no, so you got kind of a cedar pine ridge. Right. A lot of times when you have these ponderosas growing, these junipers, these cedars, um, you know, that's usually a dry climate and those roots suck up what moisture they have. So right. there's usually not a lot of good cover under those trees. We see a lot of limber pine ridges out here. Yeah, there's yeah, and again, stuff. the hawk can perch himself yep. right up there. Yep. Um, but that being said, uh, I've got a creek behind my house that's tall cottonwoods. You know, some of the cottonwoods are huge. Mm -hmm. And by God, at times, they'll be chuckering that. Not very often, but... Um, so again, I, I, I'm not a big fan of these pine ridges, and once in a while there'll be some birds in there, but I, what I find is, you know, and I used to hunt those a lot, thinking, oh man, they, they're going to be in that kind of stuff. And they just most of the time weren't. Right. I'm not going to be surprised, Todd, if you call me and say, hey, I hunted this pine ridge, and we both know it, and you got in some birds, the it'll birds happen. Are where you find they are, them, they are right? where you find them, right, <laughs> right. So we've, um, again, I, I, so you're looking for a lot of that out there and you know again i've got dogs that can can move out there right. to to find birds and sometimes you're going to find them in spots that just don't make sense but they are where they are yep too so but i you're going to do your dog a favor and especially if you're a, a flushing guy <laughs> you can't have a dog out there flush a covey 200 yards no. out it just doesn't work no you know um you're gonna you're, you may have a great flushing dog uh but you've got to you know, kind of put him in a, a winning situation. Hundred percent. You got to yeah. set him up for success. Yeah. We got some big country, here. especially young dogs. Right. You know, if, if I take my old, my twelve-year-old out, he knows exactly where to look for birds. Whether I don't care what it is, he's hunted enough. I've shot enough Huns and sure. truckers over him. He knows where to find where he's going to find those birds. My three-year-old doesn't have a clue. He's hunted primarily waterfowl. Sure. And a few pheasants. Um, I learned the hard way with. A couple of labs in the past that if I start them on upland birds, it's really hard to keep them steady up for water. Well, what's the old saying? Different horses for different it horses. That's exactly right. That's exactly right. I don't have saddle mules. You probably wouldn't have seen me ride one of those <laughs> in Kentucky Derby. You know. <laughs> That's exact. That, no, you're exactly right. <laughs> yeah, so, yeah. 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 It's it's just interesting how that is. But setting those dogs up for success is very important. Right. So looking at. Looking at cover and going, okay, yeah, this is custom made for the dog. There's probably going to yep. be some birds in here. That's what I'm going to focus sure, on. Sure, sure. Yeah, that, that just makes sense. Well, we have some questions from your uh -huh. YouTube channel here that I went and poached. One of the most interesting things that I've seen on, on your show is a little string on your barrel. Oh, and yeah. I think it's <laughs> Wit, Witafell348 <laughs> asks, what... What's with the string on the end of the barrel? And I added to that question, how'd you come up with that? Well, hopefully more, most of us visit a dentist on occasion. Sure. And the dentist gives you a little kit. Yeah. Sends you on your way. Hopefully you didn't have any molars to fill or a right. root canal. They always give you that little little spool of, of dental, dental floss. floss. So what happens is, um, you know, uh, Point dogs especially here, you'll go in on point. Mm -hmm. Now this is Wyoming, you've been here long enough. This wind can sometimes vortex on you. Big time. Okay, you're heading this way, it's right at you. You stepped 20 feet further and it's coming here. Yeah. 20, another 20 feet, it's here. Especially on days when we don't have a hard wind. Right, so a lot of times these dogs go on point. And um, sometimes it's, I, 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 I kind of equate it to this. Let's say, Todd, you're, you're elk hunting and you're just quietly creeping through the, through the forest there, and you hear a twig snap. You're looking straight ahead, but you, you hear it from over here. 
you kind of want to hear it again, so what you probably don't do is turn your head. You just, you freeze. Well, dogs sometimes will do that. That scent may be coming in at an angle to them. So the dog may be sort of looking that way. And when you're coming into the dogs to flush the birds, you know, you're behind them coming into them. Sure. So you don't always see their eyes. Right. Now the dog's eye, now the, so the dog's pointing this way. The scent could be coming in this way. You don't know that. Right. And his eyes might tell you, but you're, you're looking around. But you're not in front of the dog, right. okay? Exactly. So a lot of times, especially with these little mini vortexes we have out here, is uh, I'm going in, and, and, and many times I would go straight into that dog, thinking, okay, he's pointed right there. Those birds going to be about 30 feet. Right. And I get there, and I'm messing. Where are the birds? Where are the birds? This, I know he's got birds. And they're, they're a 90 degree angle over to me. Right. You're out. looking here and they flush off your left so shoulder. So a lot of times going into a point, I'll just have that little piece of dental floss. You can see it on your videos. You can see the yeah, little string and just sometimes, off the gun barrel. Yeah, and, and just, okay, so the wind's coming here. Right. So that's not all the time, but just, and I didn't, I guess I didn't learn to do that um, um, from anybody, but I remember before I got into upland hunting here, I was a pretty avid predator caller. Okay. You know, coyotes, bobcat, and all that. You mm -hmm. wind is paramount. You Huge. need to understand it. And um, so, especially with coyotes, you know, a lot of times they'll wind you. It's like, how did that coyote know I was here? You know, he came right behind me. Right. So anyway, I had enough of these points that I was going into, and the birds weren't quite where I thought. And yeah, sure, sometimes, Todd, those dogs are right on those oh, yeah. birds. Sometimes. They are. They are. So sometimes, and you'll feel it on the back of your neck sometimes, you're gonna, you're, you'll feel it, you'll, okay, the wind's going this way, but all of a sudden you're gonna feel that wind, and it's just slight. I'll tell you one time, one of our saddle mules in our it, it, hay field, it was um, January, February years ago, it was one of those cold 20 degree uh, negative mornings, 20 below zero. And I've got some pretty nice weather gauge, zero mile per hour wind. So I'm watching that mule, he's just standing out there in the middle of my field and his perspiration is just, you can see it, it's just, there's no wind, but it's just sort of floating. Mm -hmm. So again, these dogs, you know, we, these pointing dogs, um, you know, they need, they need to work off a of scent. So those birds aren't always what's going to be obvious to you. Dogs probably know where they're at. But again, it's just like, Todd, you, you're walking straight ahead to the woods, you hear just a, a twig snap. Right. You're, you, you kind of freeze because you don't want you want to hear it again right. and you know if you turn your head you might kind of lose that right. concentration right. so right. that's what it is and it you know there's times that it didn't matter you know but it there's times it has too so it's interesting you talk about that because the first thing that when I when I saw it when I saw it on your the first time I saw it on your video I saw that string it I knew exactly what it was for mm -hmm. I instantly took me back to the days when I hunted traditional art with a eh, with traditional archery. Oh, equipment. sure, sure. And I had a piece of dental floss yeah. on my bow leg oh, with sure. a little feather. Okay. And it would constantly show me those little mini wind directions. Right. And I could make adjustments for that. It makes total sense, especially for up country, open country upland bird hunting, where a dog goes in on point, like you said, they've got that scent, but that bird may have, it may have moved. It may be over here. You walk in, I don't know how many times how many times that I've done that, and just crazy. We ha I had a I had a situation this fall hunting pheasants. <coughs> Small, not a very big cornfield at all, mm -hmm. full of weeds. Perfect pheasant field, right? They don't run all over the place in there. They actually will hold because they have cover. And I had my my middle daughter with me, who's who's six. We're walking along, and I'm. I'm hunting this field totally confusing the pheasants. Like, I'll walk, I'd walk the perimeter, and then I'll cut diagonal across it. And then sure. I'll make another loop through it. And then the last thing I do, if I haven't shot anything, is I'll walk that perimeter again. Mm -hmm. Well, dog, those birds can't. You're, you're pushing them. Right. And hopefully right. you're pushing them into a corner. Right. And my young dog's in there, and he's working. We have that typical southwest wind, Right. And he's working into that wind and that we're working the field so he can work into the wind. He's running rows. And I looked at my daughter. I said, we need to get up ahead of him around that point, around that corner. Because anything he's working is going to push into this corner. Right. Yeah. We pushed into the corner. When we got to the corner, the wind was straight southeast. And it wasn't a windy day, but it was exactly like what you were talking mm -hmm. about. The wind had shifted a little bit. He turned and went southeast. And when he did that, 
when he made his turn into the wind, a rooster ran out into the into the little you know the irrigation mm-hmm. room. Saw us, flushed. Sure. Killed it. Yeah. Being able to play the wind in those scenarios, whether it's out in the wide open or in a cornfield or whatever, you're, it's, yeah, I, I saw that string on your bell and I was like, that's smart <laughs> I, right there. I've, I've gotten quite that. a few questions about it, so. I'm going to tie a string to my, I've yeah. got a, so on my upland gun, I, I shoot a Stevens, uh, Stevens over and under 555. Five, five. Mm-hmm. I got that gun Super too. Super light, I love that gun. Yeah, almost too light. And it's the swing. It's quick. It's a great gun. It's, yeah, it, it, it's a great point and shoot gun. Yeah, it you is. You know what I yeah. mean? Yep. Yeah. Um, but I'm when I saw you did that, I went and tied a piece of dental floss on that barrel. I was like, I love that idea. That's, yeah, that's great. So there's a <laughs> there's another question. Oh, Chucker Man seventy eight um, asked, "Do you hunt anything other than chuckers?" And I think we've answered that question a little bit. Yeah, you know. So growing up in Iowa, right. You know, I, I still have a lot of respect for. Uh, uh, you know, the pheasant. Absolutely. And I've killed a few here. I'm a wild bird guy. Yeah. Okay. I'm 100% wild birds, but um, we do have some wild pheasant here. There's some very good wild pheasant. Uh, but I'll tell you, I, I was fortunate enough to grow up in, you yeah. know, what was once the pheasant you. capital. Spoiled yeah, you. I yeah. know a lot and of I, guys that went to Iowa every year from Michigan. You bet. You went bet. Out there hunting pheasants. Yeah, so. yeah. So I I love seeing the enthusiasm for other people with, with pheasants, but I. And, I call them ditch chickens. Yeah, but that's uh, it's ditch parrots. Ditch parrots. You know, <laughs> it's it, it's. I say it with love. Yeah, no, absolutely. <laughs> but I'll tell you, um, in my opinion, I, I really think that uh, and the difference between these Wyoming pheasants versus the pheasants I grew up with in Iowa, these guys run. Oh man. Iowa did a little bit, but man, these guys have legs on them. These birds, yeah, to that's the a, point where if you're. It's almost an act of futility hunting them solo. Mm-hmm. You're better right. off hunting to, hunting with somebody else. And we have so much, so many irrigation canals. Right, here. right. That's why these birds run because they they, oh, they can straight line it. Yeah, and they go. And you're better. You're so much better served to hunt two guys coming together. Yeah, you know? yeah. And I, I, in my opinion, in most situations. They're not a point and dog game. Uh, in the, in the thick stuff. In the th- and that's what we're hunting them in, really. Yeah. All right. that, though these canals that we have around here, it's thick cover. It, it's it's grass, a lot of it, but it's thick, right. heavy grass. It's been irrigated all summer. It's grown super thick. Right. That's tough for a pointing dog to get into. Yeah. And uh, my type of dogs, they're kind of built for more of the wide open yeah, country. And absolutely. in fact, uh, you know, uh, speaking about gear, so I don't wear the heavy Cordura chap type. No. I don't need to because I'm not I'm not yep. busting the brush. I'm right. out there, you know, in the sage and right. and things like that. Um, so I can lighten that up a little bit. But um, so back to what I hunt. You know, we talked about the blues a little bit. Mm-hmm. Um, so it's getting kind of tough uh, to do that with you know the west side of the basin with yeah. the bears and the wolves and yep. and the east side over here with just a lot of the guys. There's other just guys a lot hunting. of recreationalists. It is, yep. yeah, yeah. So. Um, I've got a few areas though that um, I wouldn't have that issue, uh, but there'll be <laughs> blues in there, uh, you know, a month before season. Right. So I'm like, I'm gonna September first. I'm or that first week of September. Yeah. I'm going there, and um, and a lot of times I get there and the, the birds aren't there. So I uh, I believe was it September first of this past season. So our chucker and hunts didn't open again till the 15th of September. Right. So I was gonna mix it up a little bit. I'm gonna work my way, and we're talking about the bighorns here, and um, I'm gonna work my way up to elevation. I'm gonna hit a few spots that probably won't have blues, but I'm gonna check out the Huns and Chucker, Mm -hmm. you know, and I'll work my way up to elevation. And um, so we're finding some birds and got up finally to about 8,500 feet and couldn't buy a blue, but they're pointing Huns up there, so. So, you know. Fun uh, stuff. Yeah, fun stuff, you know. Um, the bighorns are funny. There's a lot of stuff that on, on our side of the bighorns that comes out and it's, it, it drops off quite precipitously. But on that first bench, mm-hmm. you get such a weird mix of birds up there. Mm-hmm. I've seen sage grouse up there. Sure. Right sure. alongside of huns. Sure. And then in the, there'd be a blue grouse 20 yards further ahead down the track. You know, it's like. Holy smokes, you never know what you're going to get right. into. So I'm glad you brought that up because uh, I keep forgetting about sage grouse. Oh, man. So I've only shot one in my life. Mm-hmm. And that was about three or four years ago. I may never shoot another one. That's not for lack of opportunity. We, we have the birds. We have a lot. We and have, I, and have through have a season, birds. you know, we, my, my dogs, we find a lot of birds. I've sometimes pulled them out of an area because of all the sage grouse. Sure. You know, um, I'm mixed about the sage grouse. They're, they're struggling a little bit. We've, we'd have a stronghold here, I think. Um, 
Um, and again, I, uh, I don't, two thoughts to it. You know, our season, what is it, two, two a day, four it's possession? Two a day, four possession, and it's limited. I think we're down to 10 days or 10 something. Days, like 10 days, 10, yeah. So um, I just saw a proposal. I think they're going to try to get that down to five days. Probably. Something like that. Yeah. But um, what kind of concerns me a little bit is I understand people, it's the iconic, iconic bird of the, of the same steps out here in the prairie. Absolutely. And it excites a lot of people to to come here and hunt them, residents and a lot of non-residents. Yeah. So, and I hate to say it this way, but sometimes you gotta have the ability to kill something to care for it. I, you know, if you and I weren't Africa hunters. Africa is a classic example of that, Pat. Yeah. If it doesn't yeah. have value, if it doesn't pay, it doesn't stay. You know, yeah. and, and Afri Africa is a classic example of that, and our birds are the same way. If we put a moratorium on sage grouse, well, you just lost a whole set of people who care about that bird right. for their own reasons, and they right. want to hunt them. Right. I don't know anybody who hunts sage grouse that wants to go out and shoot limits for 10 days straight. Right. I know a lot of guys that want to go out for a weekend with their family and kill a couple of birds, right. eat them, and then that may be the only time they hunt them. The mindset on hunting sage grouse, in my opinion, has shifted drastically mm -hmm. because of the birds, because of the way the birds are struggling in the, across their right. the greater part of their range. Right. Um, yeah, could you go out here and shoot limits of birds every day for five days? Probably. Are you probably going to have a massive impact? Probably not. But I think from, I'm in, the, I'm in your boat. A couple of those, I'm good with. You know, this is. I'll shoot a couple. If I get a great big cockbird, sure. Probably going to mount it. Yeah, sure. You know sure, what I mean? Sure. They're impressive. Now, this isn't sage grouse season, but I remember one time, speaking of sometimes a lot of sage grouse, it was the last day of the season, four or five, six years ago, January 31st. Right. And uh, I went to an area that um, it's, a, it's a, again, one of those big plateaus that had a lot of sage grouse, mm -hmm. but a lot of times a lot of chucker too on there. So. Um, funny, went out there, <laughs> and the dogs pointed before, I, I didn't get a real early start. It was about a 20 minute drive from my house, so it didn't take long to get there. Before noon, those dogs pointed 14 uh, times on sage grouse, mm -hmm. and probably hundreds of birds. Oh yeah. You know, sometimes three or four sage grouse here, sometimes 20 in a, that's in, the thing. In a group, you yes, know. That's and I finally thing. just put the dogs up, and we, we quit at noon. You see, we had a good season. Yeah. They didn't have anything to prove. I didn't have anything to prove. We didn't need to kill the chucker that last day. And right. it was fun pointing those birds, but I finally just pulled the birds out, yeah. dogs out of there. So yeah. now what concerns me about the sage grouse, which I think it isn't talked about enough, and I think this segues into our mule deer crash, mm -hmm. is um, overgrazing. There's a lot, there's a lot of cards, a lot of layers to that onion. Go ahead. Okay, well, I'm pretty opinionated on it. Um, and I was in the cattle business several years ago, so I can see both sides a little bit. You know, some of the rant, so we'll, we'll talk about some of the excuses or answers to this, but one of the, my main issue the last, I think, three years now of bird hunting is, uh, luckily, you know, I've been, I'm, I'm a, a local yokel here. I know where to go. If one area is bad, we're going to find birds, and not, not every day we're going to have double-digit points. Sure. And that's not what we're always doing this about. But, you know, we do, you do want to get into birds on occasion. That's the point. So, um, Otherwise you'd sit home my main nemesis has been <laughs> overgrazing. So I may go into an area full of birds. Uh -huh. And so, man, I got to take a buddy of mine in there. Two weeks later, go there, and it's already grazed down to nothing. When you graze this stuff down to nothing, guess what grows? Cheat grass. Yep. When, you, when you take this stuff out there and turn it from a nice habitat uh, for birds, for forget about my narcissistic little view on game birds sure. and my little selfish chucker and hunts. You know, you've got we've got a mule deer crash. Oh, bad! And boy, they want to talk about diseases, but they they're afraid to talk about you know cheatgrass, antelope. There's so and, much antelope so are much taking bad. a yep. a dive. Yep. So you know, and I'm friends with a lot of ranchers, and we're talking public lands ranchers. You know, a lot of these guys said, you know, I know, but. The BLM is telling me, lose, use it or lose it. Then you go on the BLM and I get these, what are you talking about, and denials. And some people want to help, but the BLM is, there's some good people. Believe me, there sure. are some good people, sure. but it's a bureaucratic dump is sure. what it is. Sure. The Bureau of Rec is a wreck. <laughs> Especially this Heart Mountain crap is a absolute wreck. 
as far as habitat, you know. Um, you know, I know some people at the BLM care, their, their hands are kind of tied. Uh, I'm sure some of the ranchers are abusing the, the situation, and some are just, they got to use it or lose it. Yes. So sometimes, hey, you've got to graze this from November 1st yep, to... this is your time allotment, and we want this many units. So proper grazing, though, actually is a plus to, I think, the sage grouse, yes. the deer, yes, uh, the, the antelope, is when they go in and, and don't take all the vegetation, and, and yeah, sometimes it doesn't look great right now, but the regrowth. Mm -hmm. Rest it a year or two years. Rotate, rotate the, the livestock. Right. So, that, you know, we're, again, um, I've, I've raised hell about some of this stuff, and uh, um, the agencies like to go silent. Oh, yeah. Now, talk about overgrazing. Uh, um, when's the last time you've been up to Burgess Junction, like North Tongue River? Yeah, it's highly overgrazed. <sighs> I mean, that's a whole different subject, <laughs> but, uh, you know, that's the Forest Service there. And they, you know, complaints to them. And I'm not talking about just me getting on the phone or going to the I office. Have, I have a personal... A lot of friends of mine have right. made calls. I have, and I have a lot of friends who are cattle producers, and... We all like to eat. We, we all like to <laughs> you eat. You bet. Right, and I like to eat elk more than I like to eat beef, but we won't, yeah. get, it. We won't get into that. <laughs> but yeah. I, I struggle with, I struggle with seeing... And this is my personal opinion. Opinions like elbows, man. Everybody's got a couple of them, right? But I struggle with seeing the amount of cattle on the national forest for the length of time that they're there. Yeah. I go up yeah. there, and national forage use is the model is multiple use, right? Mm -hmm. It's got to be logged. It's got to be grazed. It's got to be recreated. It's ideally you want to produce. You want to. You want that land to produce. Whether it's producing beef, whether it's producing timber, whether it's you producing bet. minerals, whether it's producing energy production, whatever. But our our national view of our forests and usage of our forests has changed over time. Mm -hmm. And I think it's it's starting to shift as a more recreational use. That's you're starting to see more and more of that. We're seeing Especially after COVID. <laughs> we're seeing fee areas pop mm -hmm. up all over the place yes. where you have to pay to be in this area or this area or this area. And how much, how much I'd like to see a comparison of how much money is generated from fee areas versus how much money a rancher is paying per unit to graze that. I can tell you what they're paying. They're paying a dollar, I know what they're dollar paying. thirty-five a month for a cow-calf pair, which is four and a half cents a day. Okay, so if we take, say he's got 300 pairs up there. Yeah. And, and at that at that rate, how what's the offset with a fee use area i don't know right but it's and i'm not saying i want to get rid of those i want to get rid of cattle producers i don't i but i think we could i think we could look at things a little bit differently than the way we're just doing status quo right across right. the board when we did our sage grouse film and if you haven't seen it guys go to the youtube channel and check it out it's on there it's on the eastman's youtube channel it's long, the long form. Film I watched like part of it the other day. Half. Didn't see it all yet, but and yeah, there we good start to when it. When we started peeling back layers, mm -hmm. it was like everybody wants to blame energy production. It's right. the energy. It's oil and gas. It's their fault. No, nope, not necessarily. Well, it's those greedy ranchers. Nope, not necessarily. Well, it's it's climate change. Well, not necessarily. It's so many different layers that come together to create this really hard time for these birds. Right. Where we have cheatgrass invasion, we have we have ravens, an infestation of ravens that just wreak havoc on things. We have feral horse problems. Mm. We, ha we do have some overgrazing issues. Yeah. We do have some things that oil and gas have done actually a phenomenal job in giving back and making sure that things are better than they were when they, when they left them. But... It's not just one thing. No, it's not. You know? it's, it's not. It's so hard to just be like, well, we do this, we fix our mule deer problem, mm -hmm. our sage grouse problem, our animal problem, and then you have a winter like last year comes through and just right. levels the playing field and says yeah. it doesn't matter what. Now you our do. winter wasn't as bad as what they had down by Rock so, Springs. And, that <laughs> and they're getting it again. Yeah. So right. we guy, so guy Eastman just did his winter range update after talking to the oh, biologists sure, down sure. there, and their winter counts, and they're down 
they're they're losing fawns on a daily basis. Mm, yeah. Well, the, the the few fawns that were born last spring, they're up to almost I think the numbers above sixty percent winter kill now. And then you've got you know the eagle population. <coughs> And I love seeing eagles and hawks. They're great. I have hawks that mess up with my hunting a lot. I've had them follow me with the dogs and dive in as the dogs are pointed because they can see the covey from... And well, it goes back. <laughs> eagles and have that, done it too, yeah, but, but that, they eat a lot of fawns too. And that, they eat a lot of fawns. Yeah. They eat a lot of birds. You know, they figure... All the biologists I talked to, was, and we're talking about sage grouse here, is they figure that once a sage grouse reaches maturity, he's just about predator-proof. Mm-hmm. He can sure. outfly. He can outfly aerial predators, avian predators, and a coyote. Good luck. And he's a, good he's luck like a he's built like a rock. Yeah. yeah. Their and their their vision's excellent. They're perfectly adapted to their habitat, mm-hmm. and they're they're really there's other things that get them fences, barbed wire fences, bird strikes. Man, that was an eye opener. Right. Um, and there's some stuff just north of us up here on some sage grouse range. If you go and drive it, you'll see all the markers on the fences. Right, those, so yeah, because the, the they'll fly about four feet fly high, about that high off and that's ground. where that fence is at, yeah, and they got the little, little reflectors yep. that yep. You know, float in the my wind a little bit. My kid went up there running the dogs the other day, because I, I, I like to run my dogs. I rode my I rode my labs. I'm one of the few guys that probably yeah. actually does that, but I rode them. Right. I want them in shape all the time. Now, we speak about that and kind of just, the, we won't call it the structure of the habitat as much as just a lot of uses coming at it mm-hmm. at once. Sure. But you know, there, there, there are some benefits too. Um, a lot of times oil production has water coming up. Tons, that's what that's what nobody <laughs> wants to talk about, about oil and gas. Right. Is there's a lot of benefits. Man, I've seen a lot of birds oh, around I, oil and gas. I've hunted chucker right in right inside oil fields. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. So back to that predator thing though, because this is something that is across the board, and I talked to a lot of different guys about it. And I think any time, and it goes back into what we were talking about, wolves and grizzly bears as well. Right. Anytime we set aside a class of animal and we don't manage it, we do not manage it. We refuse to. We don't, these are off limits over here. Mm-hmm. Hawks and eagles, for example. Ravens, Owls, like you said, too. Ravens, ravens with the, the eggs. Birds stealing. of prey. We'll just lump them all into that category. We don't manage them at all. Let natural mortality take effect. Mm-hmm. And we have, now we are we are a wintering area for like rough leg hawks and different types of right. hawks that come in from up north mm-hmm. and, and winter here. But yeah, man, our birds take a beating and so do, so do our fawns take a beating. Um, they're seeing this in, you said, you said you lived in Florida. They've had to cancel a bunch of all these big tournaments that they used to run because of the sharks. Right. They reduce shark harvest down to oh, nothing, yeah, and yeah. now there's more sharks than they know what to do with, and they're eating themselves out of house and home. Yeah. We saw the same thing here with the wolves. You know, so anytime we pick out one thing and, and hammer right. on it or set it yeah. aside, it's like, no, there's got to be way more. Yeah. It's a whole pie type of scenario. Yeah, so again, you know, that overgrazing has been, I think, my number one enemy sure. for three years sure. running now. Um Again, yeah, I know I have enough places. I've a lot of times you're driving an hour and a half to go to this spot, and yeah. you know they've got it already down to just cow pies and dirt. So we, we I can, can I can go down the road. I'll right. find something to hunt, but right. not, you know now. And let me. I want to bring this up before yeah, I forget it, Todd. Another issue out there I found is, um, um, and it, it's it's been an issue where I almost had to pull the trigger on it. Um, are these uh, livestock guard dogs mm. out there on the BLM running with normally with sheep? These Pyrenees and these Anatolies and these these crossbreds, mm-hmm. um, somebody's going to get hurt on one of these dogs. Um, oh, it's already happened. Do you have yeah. time for one little story? I can tell go you. Go ahead. Yeah, so, go ahead. And I and again, we're not picking on these no, livestock but, producers. This is more for the guy that's coming out here and is going to go hunt. You bet. You need to have your head on swivel because this is something that I guarantee you. Dudes from Iowa aren't thinking no, about when no. they come out west to hunt birds. You can be out in the big empty, and I'm going to crest this hill. I'll give you two quick stories. So you've seen Lonesome Dove, probably yeah, the original. Absolutely. You remember the hundreds of times the scene where um, they're out there, and all of a sudden there's the last herd of buffalo. Remember, yep. Gus chase. and Deets are going to, for old times' sake, chase those buffalo over the hill. So and then they went over the hill, and about two seconds later, they're coming back with a two two hundred. Uh, Sue, Blackfeet, Sue, Blackfeet yep. coming after Blackfeet, yeah. So similar situation, uh, there's a spot where I parked and cut loose the dogs. I had two of them. They went over a hill, and I'm kind of getting, you know, 
adjust my strap and, and, and pull the gun out of the case and I'm going to head towards the dogs, they're running back at me with seven of those uh, Great Pyrenees on their tails. So I hadn't shut the truck up yet. So I had the back door, I've got a four door F-150 and uh, I'm like, son of a gun, these dogs are coming at us. And um, luckily, I, uh, both my dogs jumped in the back seat of my truck. I was able to slam the truck. These dogs, there's, I believe, seven of them in that situation right at me. They're biting the end of my barrel of my gun. And they're going after me now. And I almost had to pull the trigger. Sure. And I'm screaming at them because that's the last thing I want to do. Is yeah, shoot yeah. you don't want to shoot one of them. Exactly. So, so anyway, they kind of backed off enough, and I <laughs> jumped in my truck, and I got the dogs safely behind me, and they're just circling the truck. So I go somewhere else. So what there was, unbeknownst to me, was a, I was just in that same spot about a week before, unbeknownst to me, it was a big, you know, flock of sheep just over the hill. Sure. So flash forward, um, I've had several situations, but a couple years later, me and a friend are hunting, close to the same area. And we're, we go over that proverbial hill. And um, we had just gotten off a point, so luckily my two dogs were fairly close to me. We start hearing barking. Here comes 13 of them. Oh, wow. So I'm from, I said, Steve, hold my gun. I'm trying to get my leashes on these dogs. So they're going for the dog yeah. for, off the bat. That's, that's, they're trained to kill coyotes. So we literally, they're not okay, trained, I, I guess, yeah, right, right. right. The and they're looking at, they're looking at an English setter Absolutely. or a Labrador. They're looking at it as a canine. That's it's not exactly necessarily right. a fellow dog. That's exactly right. This is like, a, they're, they're after the, the wolves. And I agree with the premise of these livestock dogs. 100%. I, Yes. But, but um, so anyway, these dogs come into us and we're, we didn't have to shoot any, but we were really close to it. And again, and the first time I called the BLM, and again I did, you know, and their kind of hands are tied and you start looking at the laws. Man, you know, you, one of these dogs can pretty much, and I hate to bring a kid into the situation, but I'm worried about maybe not me. I'm going to get some shots off before they get me. What if you're out there with one of your young daughters rock hounding? arrowhead right. hunting. Right. You go over a hill, you're not armed. You go over a hill and here's these dogs. You might be in trouble. Yeah. If you look at Iowa, or a, excuse me, Wyoming law, boy, they don't do a whole lot to protect you and I, the public land user. Right. And you even tried to save your life. You know, there's kind of a mm -hmm. castle doctor yeah, law. Stand your ground. Stand law. your ground right. law, you know. You may be paying for somebody's dogs. Yeah. And you may have a chunk of flesh out of your arm. So, yeah, that's, I think. So that's it's, been an issue out there that yeah. you, you should be. You no, know, I don't see them everywhere, but I guess I. And um, so, what what's the solution to that then? The the local, if it's all BLM land, the local BLM should be able to tell you. You if know, you make a call, I, I, if you can get somebody to answer the phone. If, if it, right, office. right. Well, you know, I think the idea is you know, a lot of times these sheep herds, especially, you know, there's always a herder with them. Right. And those guys, before they brought in the livestock dogs, they, uh, guard dogs, they were kind of the guys keeping the coyotes off and the lions right. off these, these right. this livestock, you know. But you better speak Spanish. <laughs> yeah. So and, I'm not, and I'm not being no, no, no. at all. And they hire a lot of Basque. Well, a lot of Basque and, and a lot of and Peruvians. Lot. that are even, yes. And some of those are like South American Indian. Yeah, and they don't. I've run yeah. into these guys in the mountains in September hunting elk. Exactly. They right. do not speak English. No, if no, If they do, no. it's very limited, very broken. You know, I just think there ought to be some way to warn the public and maybe put a little bit of the burden back on the, the, the sheep producer on these dogs need to be um, kind of uh, watched a little bit more. You know, they do it, and they do it in the mountains. Pat, they, there's 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 signs up where there's sheep. I've being, seen that. Yeah. They put signs yeah. up in the mountains. Yeah, but they don't see and it. A lot of times at campgrounds, though, and in some obvious places, right? There's there's spots where uh, and then just right up here in the Bighorns when they'll have on on uh, Bald Bald Mountain. Yeah, yeah. And they'll have those. There's always a couple hundred head of sheep that are in you there bet. rotating through that. Yeah. In that country, and there's signs up. They and they don't. They're not always there. But right. When they're right. there. There there's signs up. It's just it's it's you bring up an interesting point. I think it's something that that folks just need to be really aware of, right? Because it's no different in that situation than you're dealing with wolves. You know, all these guys that hunt hunt birds in the Great Lakes area, and they're and they're dealing with wolves with their eating their bird dogs. The lion hunters around here were getting getting their hounds yeah. killed right on the Abs tree from a pack of wolves. Yeah. I mean, the guys in northern Wisconsin that are 
in Minnesota and the UP that are having English setters taken off their leash. Right, you right. Know? And it's no different. So it's something you have to be aware of. You have to be ready to deal with. For sure. I'm, I'm more than happy to give them a wide berth. Oh, yeah. Just let yeah. me know they're there. That's my thing. If I pull into an area and I know they're there, I see those sheep on the hill or whatever, I'm probably going to go someplace else. Yeah. Because if I see sheep, I know there's going to be guardian dogs with them. Yeah, I, yeah. I know that. And where yeah. we live in our country, in this country, there's going to be livestock dogs with them. And I'll tell you, I think those the big white ones, those purebred Pyrenees aren't so bad, but they're cross- Cross There's a now cross with, some, with a, and I think it's an Anatolian Shepherd. Yeah, there you go. Yeah, and those ones are nasty. Yeah, I've yeah. seen that. I've seen those dogs. Yeah, the big white Pyrenees, they seem to be a lot more chill. Yeah, those Anatolies are the the shepherds are the ones with the they're you know no they're about joke. ninety pound dog. They're no joke. And again, they're first coming after your bird yeah. dogs. Yeah. You know, um, and again, I'm I want to be the, I'm the last guy that wants to shoot one of these dogs. Right. But I, a couple times now, I've. Again, I one situation they're biting the end of my barrel because that time that the dogs that the two dogs I got in the back of my truck, sure. I'm trying to get in my truck. Right, and my door was shut. <laughs> yeah, you got to open it and get in without. So getting yeah, hit. sort of that. Okay. Yeah. And there I'm holding this gun, That's and it's tough, man. safety's off, and they're biting the end of the barrel. And um, so the 13 dogs that jumped us, you know, I called the BLM and well, would you film it? I said, well, you know, I had a camera on me. My buddy did. We didn't have time to turn the damn things on. You right. know, you just, right. you know, it was, <laughs> it was, Harry Deal. Harry Deal is, is to get, luckily our dogs, I want to get them and get them on a leash. So we're talking about we're on the, 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 the dangers, the things you got to be aware mm-hmm. of when you're hunting birds out here. I don't hunt birds early. Number one, I'm usually hunting big game that time yep, of year. Yeah, sure. But the other reason that I don't hunt birds early is growing up, growing up where I grew up, I am deathly afraid of rattlesnakes. Yeah, I am yeah. not. I am not above admitting that. So if we're hunting sage grouse in September, so we only have a weekend or you know a week to do it. Right, right. I'm. I don't see a lot of snakes in the sagebrush in that one in those mosaics. I don't see a lot of snakes in those areas ever. Where I bump into snakes is when I start getting around rocks in the, yeah. in the fall. Yeah, one of those den areas. What are, what's your what's been your experience early with snakes? Well, I had a dog get bit one time. Now that was before season. That was actually behind my house. Okay. Just, and I, I snake break my dogs, sure. but that doesn't that may not help well, you when you have a dog running ninety miles an hour down. down a little trail. Whack. And and that snake will whack them before they can smell it and back off. Right. Right. So it can happen. Now during hunting season, I've seen anywhere from zero to maybe three or four snakes in a whole season. Some places I pulled out of because I know there's more than right. a few of them. I'm, I'm seeing one here. You're and, seeing one, and then look, and you're like, yeah, there's so a den, there's see, a den here. So where somewhere. I see most, more snakes is actually something that people don't talk about a lot. Is um, They seem to love those abandoned, uh, not prairie dog towns, but they love those too. Right. Those pocket gopher. Oh, yeah. The, they, the small, smaller yeah. the hole, the bigger the snake. Snakes love that stuff. I don't see them around rocks as much as, as you would think. But Interesting. There's, so... Um, I take my chances, you those know. Ground squirrel, those little ground squirrel, and they're in a sagebrush. They like to be in the sagebrush. And I believe what those what those ground squirrels will do is they'll have these little holes go down, and it goes down to more chambers, sure, and sure. and it's it kind of spider webs. Um, so I got bit by a snake. Ooh. Um, Ninety thousand dollars. Everybody's got that for chump chump change. So that was not hunting season. So that was uh, oh in August. Um, so this is. Four or five years ago, I had gotten a new setter pup, and he was about 10, 12 weeks old. And um, I had him back just walking in my hay field in the back. And it, it, we were, it, it was just mowed, so it was short grass out there. And he's doing a Mexican standoff with a pretty good sized rattler. So I grabbed the pup before that snake can get him. Yeah. The snake didn't bite him because he didn't want to bite him. Otherwise, he would have nailed him. Right. Grabbed the pup. Went um, to the kennel, threw him in, grabbed a spade, went out there to get the snake, couldn't find him. Two days later, um, within probably 50 feet of there, um, I'm doing a little bit of yard work. My wife had, was out of town visiting some family back in Iowa, so she was gone for about a week. <laughs> what my neighbor had done, our driveway, I've got a mile long driveway, so the grass grows pretty tall. And usually what I do is run a lawn mower, a riding mower, and kind of cut that. I kind of let it go that year. My neighbor, bless his heart, has an old uh, antique John Deere tractor, the old putt, 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 with a sickle bore. He yeah. came down my lane and just cut that grass. Sickle bar mowed it. So what it did was that 
okay, that grass then laid flat. So that grass about two to three oh, feet laid yeah, flat. Yeah, yeah. So I thought, you know what I'm gonna do? I'm gonna take our riding mower and kind of go over that and just you know mulch a little bit and push it to the side. So there's this one spot that always had two or three rocks that I've always hit. And I thought, you know, get off your butt. Get out there after all these years. Move, move. move the rocks. So those rocks are covered by this tall grass. I know where the rocks are at. I reach in there, and that snake gets me just the knuckle right here. And I'll tell you what, you've had a paper cut worse than how he got me. He got barely, his fang just raked it. I'm thinking, well, no big deal. My wife's out of town. So I did the old John Wayne, you know, suck on it. <laughs> and I thought, you know, luckily we have insurance. And so I thought, you know, it's starting to hurt and swell up, you know. Um, so I thought, you know, it was a it was a Thursday afternoon. I'm gonna, you know, I'm gonna go to the hospital and get a shot, and it's all done. I get to the hospital, and uh, they tell me I went into some kind of a shock. So I do remember this. I remember my um, my uh, throat. I don't think it, it it swelled that you could see it, but it swelled from the inside, sure. and it started cutting off my breathing. Like I thought an, I was it's dead. Like an anaphylactic reaction. Right. This hand then swelled up. I was in there for three days. Wow. So they gave me three rounds of anti venom. And uh, each round of anti venom was how much was that? Oh, I think it's only sixteen thousand around. Yeah. <laughs> and Jeez. so each hospital Jeez. in this basin, it's so expensive. Cody went into Cody. They have one. Lovell had one. I think yeah. Whirland had one. So the ambulance had to they go. Ship them together. Yeah. Well, the ambulance had to go to Lovell and Whirland to pick up the other three. Wow. So um, I recovered pretty quickly, but I'm not so cavalier around snakes anymore. Yeah. So. I'm not one of those guys that goes out in the middle of nowhere and just starts shooting them. But and I got a little lax because I used to start to see a few around our place. Uh -huh. I was kind of a live and let live. If they're on our place, Get rid of them. I do, I do. Yeah. I don't normally out there hunting. But one time then I had a dog that, uh, he was about eight months at the time. It was first part of the season. Um, I had two pups, or brothers, they're four years old now. Had them and two older dogs. and. Two of the older dogs and one of the other pups was probably about 100 yards, 200 yards ahead of me on point. So this one young pup, he's about 100 yards in front of me. I thought, he must have a single. Oh, he was looking right at a big old snake. So I shot that snake right in front of that dog because he was, he was striking at the dog. Yeah. He just was not quite getting him. So, um, you know, it's, it's, some areas, though, can have a lot of snakes. I know some of the guys, when you really get into them, they said they're seeing a bunch. So, but I have some years... Uh, some where, Todd, where you're seeing none. Yeah. But I've seen them awfully late in the winter too. So I'll tell you one time. This is I'll never forget this. This is January 13th. I always remember that date. It was a Saturday, and it was um, in January then. So it was it was cold, but it it was kind of a thaw, but it was still in the 30s, and uh, it was kind of a tough day. And I and uh, it was getting muddy out there, and I kind of laughed myself. I, I I don't know if we got any birds or not by then, but I just laughed myself. Well, at least no snakes are out. Right. <laughs> Found one son and he was he come right out of his den and there must have been the sun hitting a spot just right. Perfect. Yeah. So uh, you know it, it didn't. You just affect, never know. Yeah, the dogs did get bit. So right. Uh, my wife, who's a big bird hunter, she's been once. <laughs> you want to talk about snake? Do we have a minute for this? Yeah. yeah do okay. It. So <laughs> my wife went with me once hunting. So um, this early season one time, and I had a spot out by Gray Bowl that uh, fairly flat. There's always a few birds there. I knew I can cut a dog loose. And he, she's, that dog is, is a female at the time. She's going to go about 150, 200 yards. There's going to be birds in this, this edge of this ridge here. And that'd be great. We're going to go out and point one or two cubbies of birds for my wife, and she can get her fill of it, you know. Well, you know, all her hunting gear. She's, <laughs> I'll never forget this. All she had that was close to hunting gear were cowboy boots. Sure. And she tucked her jeans in them, you know. So Why not? anyway, so we, we, um, we uh, and I've got a, you know, Garmin track and collar on the, on the dog. So we cut her loose in the truck. Dog goes about where I predicted, about 200 yards or so, and pointed on birds. So we're walking in there, and we're about halfway the dog, and all of a sudden I hear a rattle. So I told her to stop. She's, my wife's probably 20 feet, 30 feet this way. Stop. Well, what, what? I can just hear, sometimes that rattle, it's not like the John Wayne movies. It's sometimes just like a zzzz. Yeah, yeah. I said, don't move. So I walk over to her. She has stepped on a coiled rattler with about its head and about three inches of neck on one side trying to bite and about three inches of the tail with the tail rattling. And I said, okay. I said, don't look down, but just jump straight up and try also to jump backwards. <laughs> and so she jumped up, screamed, <laughs> jumped backwards, and of course the birds blew away. You yeah. know, but she didn't get bit.
Well, that's a plus. Uh, the only thing I questioned <coughs> about that day was my wife's never asked to go again. Yeah. So like, I, no, I'm good. Yeah, she I'm was good. good. I don't want to go. She was good. So um, I do Dude, know this. When, is, when, with uh, uh, Sometimes when you look for snakes, you can't find them, but they'll yeah. they'll find you. So. Yeah, that's, you know, that, that's one of the things that, it's just it's some one more thing you know we could we could just title this podcast the dangers of upland bird hunting in Wyoming <laughs> right you know we talk about grizzly bears and wolves and and Anatolian shepherds and rattlesnakes heat stroke on dogs I mean sure. we could go across the board um, this has been a super fun podcast yeah I've had a good time and I mean we're sitting in over an hour and a half oh geez I'm sitting here just BS uh. I love it it's it's been great I would like to revisit this again. That talk more maybe next mid next fall. Oh, sometime. that'd be great. Jump yeah. on and, and, and touch base. Um, but I've had a great time. Where can people find your YouTube channel? Well, like, you know, what, what's the title of it? Yeah, yeah. Uh, okay, what am I? Uh, bird dogging Wyoming. Bird dogging Wyoming. You can and also it's not dogging. It's it, like dogging, dogging. Dogging. Yeah. yeah. But you know, when you Google it, it, I'm also show up as you know, Google bot YouTube, and all yeah. of a sudden. They give you two names now, so I think you could Google Wyoming Upland and you'll yep, find me. Wyoming Upland is where I found it. Um, bird dog in Wyoming. Okay. Cheatgrass setters is another one that, that, pop I've, up. that I've seen yeah, that yeah. pops up. But man, it's, it's just you, for fun. You have, you have some phenomenal videos. It's just for fun. I'm not trying to sell anybody anything, no. you know. And I tell you what, I'm. I, it's kind of fun film that stuff. Sometimes the film doesn't work out like you thought it would. The editing, I don't want to sit all day and edit that no. stuff. So that's why they're kind of brief. They're brief and they're and they're raw, but for guys that are for guys that get it and that know, sure, there's some great bird action on there. You get to see some pretty scenery, and you're just out enjoying it. And a guy sitting in his office taking a 15 minute sure. break can pull that video up and go, man, I wish I was in Wyoming. I, I get a lot of uh, uh, comments like, I just love the briefness of it because yeah. you know some guys they're doing a great job. Their 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 videos are what 20, 30 minutes long. We usually shoot for that 20 minute mark. But sometimes, sometimes you know, we just want to have a cup of coffee and you're checking some emails and you've got two or three minutes to yeah. kill some time, you know. And uh, well, better yet, instead of just revisiting, we can do that. But we Let's probably need you get out, and get you out there. Let's go hunting. Get out there, That'd yeah. Be we'll fun. Uh, season. Uh, well, countdown's on. Yeah, it so is. It just ended, but it's on again. Yeah, yeah. So I'm, I'm always. Right now, I'm okay. You know, when it ended January 31st, I was kind of sullen. You know, I'm like, well, oh, we were man. trying to, we were trying to put this podcast together. When I first reached out to you, sure. you were like, after bird season's over, I'll be, yeah. I'll be down. Yeah. I'm like, all right. Yeah, yeah. So, but I'm good. You know, with this extra month, you know, it's, it's, you, you, can, you can feel the rewind going a little bit instead yeah. of, damn, it's, it's over, you know. Yeah, so, exactly. But it'll pop up again, and I'm, I think we'll have a good season again. We're, we'll find birds out we'll there. We'll be picking your brain about a dog, for sure. So, yeah. For sure. Yeah. Cool. Well, Pat, I ask, I always close up my podcast the same way. If you could only hunt one bird one way, What's hmm. it going to be? You know, it, it's, it's a toss-up between Huns and Chucker. I love them both. When I'm hunting one, I kind of think about the other. Sure. But I suppose if you put a gun to my head, uh, uh, it'd probably be the Chucker. You know, pointing dog on a Chucker up on a on a big old mountainside, and that's pretty nice. The country's pretty. country's pretty. It's great exercise. Uh, the birds wonderful are wonderful eating. Great bird. They fly hard. You bet. And you don't, you know, the, these birds, they sometimes there's an old... Billy Preston song. Sometimes the bad guy gets to win once in a while. Uh -huh. These birds are tough. These birds win more than they lose. You bet. You bet. And I'm, you know, I laugh sometimes. I'm not the best shot, but you know what? Uh, good for them. You know, we. Oh yeah. You're not going to get them all, but it's fun trying. So. I remember. I remember a day to the south of us in an oil pad, and I won that day. I had, it's the only, only time I've ever done this, I was hunting with an L.C. Smith 16 gauge, mm. double barrel. My favorite bird. You bet. About 1920s. Yep. 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 And my old lab went in, and this covey was tucked into this hillside, and they held, and they flushed, and I, with the left barrel, first barrel, front trigger, I scotch doubled. Sure. And I swung on a second, and I swung on another bird. I killed three birds with a double barrel with a side by side yeah. sixteen gauge. I was like, I won. Yeah, yeah. He fetched them all up, and I was like, That's good, dude. Let's yeah. go home. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So it's a great way to get out there and see the outdoors. You see a lot of cool stuff. Now, you speak about elk hunting. You know, I imagine if I was elk hunting, I wouldn't see a big bull. But boy, you see some big, big game out there. Some nice elk. Some yeah. nice rams I, that I, you I, you probably wouldn't see. You always see something else yes, that you're not hunting that for. Is, that is the truth. I had a yeah. really good deer tag here locally. Uh, two falls ago, 
And I think I saw twice as many chuckers as I saw deer. Sure, sure. They're just everywhere. Right. Well, Pat, thank you very much. You bet. This Thanks for asking. It was a asking. pleasure. We'll get, out and, we'll get out and chase some birds. We'll do this again. I had a great time. Thanks for asking. Yeah, so. absolutely. All I right. Had a good time, too. Thanks for watching. <laughs>